Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, I am John. I'm a trustee of Elevate Christian Disability Trust and a brand new baby Anglican deacon. Uh, I'm also from, and I quote, Greymouth Westport or somewhere in the sticks. <laughs> and you can tell what wonderful people we have in the South Island because of Amanda Landers. Thank you so much. Elevate has a 40-year history of advocating for the inclusion and human rights and the welfare of disabled people. We've got 21 local and overseas branches offering connection and spiritual and relational care to thousands of disabled people. Our newsletter print run is 5,800. Our groups have about 1,500 uh, throughout the whole country, not just the physically disabled like me, but the intellectually disabled, the blind, and their families. And we look after the whole spectrum from people like me who have spastic hemiplegia or chronic pain all the way through to the severe cases like motor neuron disease. We'd be miles rather uh, at a barbecue or a counseling session or organizing a church service. That's our usual speed. We are mounting our first political campaign in 40 years to oppose the end of life choice bill. And we'd like to tell you why. As Amanda said, the bill doesn't just apply to the terminally ill. It applies to everyone with a grievous and irremediable condition in a state of advanced decline, whatever those things mean. In our view, that means us. And that's a fact David Seymour continues to run away from. Our work shows us that pain and impairment is already and always experienced in a social and relational context. Pain is a team sport. So often, this debate is seen as a matter of personal choice, but that choice always happens in a context determined by family, society, and community. We are already deeply concerned about the message assisted dying is sending, not only to the tragic hard cases who have asked for it, but the many disabled people who ask every single day what our lives are worth to the society we live in. Statistics New Zealand already notes that chronic pain is a risk factor for suicide, and so is disability, although it's pretty impossible to get any stats on that. We know from our own work that a good half of our clients will experience suicidality, and especially when the condition is declining or progressive. But for all disabled people, extremes of emotion and difficulty adapting are common. This context has been flatly absent from debates about the bill. We spend a large part of our work and our time connecting disabled people with the care and solidarity they need and building up a context around them that affirms the value of their lives. Assisted suicide pulls in the other direction. And many of the reasons people have given in Oregon for choosing assisted dying are everyday realities for us. Things like pain, isolation, the presence of decay and limitations on bodily autonomy. These are difficult obstacles. They don't mean our lives are valueless and they don't mean our human rights are up for debate. We hear already in the first reading debate that using a wheelchair or needing help with feeding or toileting is, quote, undignified. I don't think people realize exactly how insulting that is, not only to the disabled, but to the elderly. Wiping and drooling are the stuff of able-bodied nightmares, but they are our daily lives. Your autonomous choice to commit suicide when your life starts to look like mine impacts me deeply. We may wish that autonomous choices and the feelings of others had no impact on each other. But the reality is my choices can and do affect you and the other way around. Not only does the end of life choice if build devalue the disabled, but the much vaunted safeguards are not fit for purpose. It allows the authorization of suicide based on a person's perception that their life is intolerable. All suicidal people have a perception that their life is intolerable. That's why they're suicidal. But to authorize and condone that suicide 
based on perception with no compulsory psych exam, no required consultation or counselling, no consultation with family and by a GP who may have never even met you before, we think is cavalier to the point of recklessness. I, like many Elevate clients, have an incurable condition. And I live a full and vibrant life marked by the very loss of bodily autonomy advocates of assisted dying call the supreme marker of meaning in life. Youth suicide is a tragedy. Elderly suicide calls forth all our outrage and every ounce of moral strength to make sure people know they matter and that their lives, however long, short, tragic, or allegedly burdensome, can still be open for possibility, goodness, and the value and love of others. Disabled suicide, by contrast, is thinkable. The inescapable conclusion is that disabled life matters less to us than young people's lives or the lives of the able-bodied. That is the effect of putting disabled people and disabled suicide into a separate category. I make no apology for calling Mr. Seymour's bill discriminatory, because it is. So Douglas Graham was fond of saying, hard cases make bad law, because law works by rules and categories. By allowing assisted dying for the people who want to choose it, we undermine medical trust for everyone else. I want to underline this point, even at the risk of being personal. One of my earliest memories is my four-year-old self, lying on a table, being held down while doctors in masks advanced on me to remove my cast after my first corrective surgery. This feeling comes back in adult form every time I lie down for another x-ray or get prodded with another needle. Excluding the challenges I already mentioned within my community, I'm comparatively privileged. I'm white, middle class, and 35. I speak English, I can speak at all. I have four degrees, a PhD, and a clerical collar. I am still lying there, vulnerable, prey to nameless dread. The only thing that makes that okay, the only thing, is the trust that I have in my doctors and my pain team that they will do me no harm. In Greymouth Hospital in 1987, it was the nurse my family called the nurse with brown eyes because she had brown eyes like mine, who held my hand and said they were there to help. By allowing assisted suicide, you attack this trust. By arming doctors with the power not to cease intervention or accept natural processes, but frankly, to poison people. That is not medical care. Still less is it a human right. Our experience is that it takes between two and six years for people to decline to, and decline to adapt to their condition and a large amount of time and work even to process what is happening. To throw a deeply vulnerable person prey to conflicting emotions and impulses into a context where a GP who may never have even seen a complicated condition like motor neuron disease can authorize your suicide flies against all good practice in suicide prevention, and it ignores the realities of disabled life. We agree, I do not say this often, with the former leader of the Green Party, Jeanette Fitzsimons, who said she wasn't convinced that any safeguards would be adequate to guard against abuse and protect the vulnerable. We even agree with Marion Street, who when she debated me, flatly admitted that the bill has inadequate protections against coercion. We agree with Doug Graham that the category, the trajectory, and the likely outcomes in the long term should be considered alongside the tragic case. In our view, those who put their trust in theoretical safeguards and vague promises of a better world and better information tomorrow need to recognize the lived reality for many disabled people. It's a reality marked by limitation, by cruelty, by stigma, by a thousand little and big attacks on our dignity. But these attacks and these limitations do not make us less than ourselves. We are human beings and citizens of this country, fathers and mothers, 
sons and daughters, neighbours and friends. We are loved and necessary to those we love. It is for this reason we say no illness and no impairment, however painful or terminal, can take away our dignity. And no illness and no impairment should take away our human rights, the value of our lives, or the protection of the law. Life is good, even when my life is not good now. And on behalf of Elevate and our thousands of clients, we want to live. On our darkest days, when we question the value of our lives in pain and limitation, we need our country to hold our dignity for us and reflect back to us that we are loved, willed, necessary, and equal. One final point. I don't question the good intentions of the people on the other side. But in our view, we're all in this together. It's a nice thought experiment to talk about choices as if they're isolated and people as if they don't talk to each other. But we live in the real world and we have to confront messy and emotional human realities. We believe in an inclusive society that respects the place of disabled people. We believe that people are interconnected and that one suicide, disabled or not, young or old, is a tragedy calling for more love and more help, not a human right and certainly not medical care. It is our duty as people who believe in the dignity of every life to fight this bill with everything in us and we are determined to do just that. God bless you all and God help David Seymour.